All right, well, good morning, church family. Pastor Kyle here. And um, we're just going to have a, a little chat here at my uh, dining room table. Um, this, you've noticed, is a little bit different than the way we normally do things. And it's because um, I felt like we had to call an audible. And um, I just felt that the Holy Spirit was saying, take a time out and address what's going on right now, both in our nation, but also as of tonight in our city. And so we're going to, um, we may jump back into the book of Proverbs. I had a 10 page outline with slides. We're going to talk about overcoming temptation, but I think it's far more important to talk about our current cultural moment. Uh, you're going to see this in your social media and news feeds. You're going to have to think about this and talking with friends. We're going to have to respond um, to the current state of things. And so I want us to do this with wisdom. I want us to do this with love. I want us to think through some of these major issues that are at play in our society right now. And things have been so politicized. Things are so hostile right now. It's hard to even think about these things. You have to walk around on eggshells. And so I talked with some of the pastor friends of mine, and some of them are, are going to maybe pray about the situation, but aren't going to talk about it. They're afraid that by talking about it, some of the members of their churches will get upset. Um, some of them are going to try not address anything at all. And I think if we don't address what's happening right now in our nation and in our city um, since the death of George Floyd, um, if we don't talk about the racial tension we're experiencing, if we don't talk about the rioting and the looting, I think we're missing an important opportunity. Um, the good news of Jesus Christ is not good news that's just kind of disconnected from the world and just sort of floating there. It's good news for us right here, right now, in our brokenness, in the darkness, the light shines all that much more brightly. And so we want to take a moment and we want to let the light shine on uh, the darkness of the sin, the depravity, the heartache, and the injustice that we find ourselves in the middle of. Rainier Valley Church is part of a network, a loosely affiliated network of churches in the Rainier Valley area. And um, I had uh, some pastor friends of mine that went to uh, a protest in downtown Seattle. And <clears throat> they went and their goal was to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they prayed for unity. They prayed for healing. They prayed for the end of racism. Uh, they prayed for George Floyd's family and community and for Minneapolis. And then in stark relief, so there's the kingdom of God. There's the beauty of what God has done in the gospel. And then in stark contrast, um, apparently just one street over, there was rioting, um, there was looting, there was cars being burnt and buildings being broken into and things being stolen. And so if you're like me, you felt this deep sense of just contrast. Um, and it, it reminds me of the Apostle Paul's exhortation that we are... Um, <laughs> We're pressed in on every side, but we're not crushed. We're hard pressed, but we're not destroyed. There's this juxtaposition that we're sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. Um, how do we address all of the different things that are weighing on us in the midst of this cultural moment that we find ourselves in? It's a heavy time. It is a heavy time. I was thinking about it this way. We are in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, we have been quarantined for three months, possibly going on four, depending on how things shape up. We're on the cusp of another uh, potential Great Depression or global economic collapse. We're dealing with potential food shortages. Um, we have all of the, the challenges of our regular life, trying to love our families, trying to provide, trying to figure out how to honor God in the midst of all this. And then on top of all of this now, we have, um, as of tonight, uh, the, the burning of downtowns really across the nation from Seattle, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and other cities. There's this great racial tension. Things are at a fever pitch. We're, we are um, in a moment of time where things feel deeply weighty, deeply tense, and so how is the gospel good news for us right now? What does God have to say to us right now in the place that we find ourselves? And I want to share with you first um, uh, your church's response um, to 
the death of George Floyd. This was an elder statement prepared by um, myself, uh, Steve Pratt, and Nate Porter. And it reads like this. We are horrified and heartbroken by the shocking death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota on Monday, May 25th, as well as the subsequent looting and rioting in our country. Rainier Valley Church will fully embrace, proclaim, and cherish the sacred value of all human life. So a couple of things even right there within the statement. The first is that <clears throat> we find ourselves in this situation because of human sin and depravity. Sin looks different ways and it masquerades in different ways, but it is always that temptation from back in the garden. You define good and evil. You can be like God. You can decide things for yourself. And this can result in murder. This can result in racism. This can result in hatred and division. Sin is at the root our problem. As a culture, as a nation, as a world, sin is the problem. And we are wrestling with the death of George Floyd. And one of the things that we want to get across right away is that in the church of Jesus Christ, there is no place for racism of any kind. Every human being, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, background, socioeconomic level, any other way that we would seek to find differences and divide, that we would seek to make ourselves superior to someone else, in every way, the thing that matters of every human being is that we are made in the image of God. Every single human being you have ever met or you will ever meet is made in the image of God, regardless of ability, regardless of uh, physical ability, regardless of financial income, regardless of cultural background, every single human being is made in the image of God. They are worthy. They are deserving. It is right. It is our honor. It is our duty. It is baseline Christian command that we are to treat every single human being with dignity, value, and respect. And so therefore, when an image bearer is killed, it should be a deep offense. It should provoke us. Which is why it goes on and says, Witnessing the death of an image bearer of God is horrifying in any context. Watching the horrific video of George Floyd's death at the hands of local law enforcement has doubtlessly been alarming, upsetting, and painful for all of us. As, <clears throat> as a former police cadet, I recognize that law enforcement is, first, it's biblical. So if you trace the pattern of scripture in Genesis 3, after sin in the fall, um, God puts an angel to guard the Garden of Eden, and he gives the angel a sword. And the sword is the means of creating compliance. And so as you follow the biblical story, God creates societies, he ordains governments, or governments carry the sword, um, and they do it to administrate justice. And so some of the terms that we use in our culture is we say that the police are called to serve and protect. That is a weighty responsibility. That is a privilege. And that is a sacred honor. I know many in law enforcement. And the goal in law enforcement is to protect and to serve. And if necessary, to lay your own life down for the sake of others. And here's where it gets really difficult and dicey. Sometimes that requires using force. Sometimes that requires even using lethal force. But in this video, one of the reasons it's so gut-wrenching is that there was no necessity for force and no warrant for lethal force whatsoever. And so this is why we continued in our elder statement saying, we join our nation in grieving this irrational loss of life. There was no reason no reason at all for that excessive, vindictive overuse of force. As God's people, we are called to love, to mourn with those who mourn. We offer our sincere condolences to George's family and community. This whole situation has been politicized. So if I say one thing, people will be really frustrated. If I say another thing, people will be really happy. There's, there's all sorts of groups. There's all sorts of opinions. But brass tacks, 
raw data, a man died, his family is grieving. And so what it means to be human and certainly what it means to be a follower of Jesus is that we mourn with those who mourn. We mourn with those who mourn. And we offer our sincerest condolences. And I want us to recognize as well that George's family has gone on record in saying that to grieve and to mourn them, um, that we do not honor George's memory by rioting and protesting. So we can mourn, but we should, and we ought not to allow that anger that we feel, that righteous anger, to make way to unrighteous anger that produces violence and all sorts of evil. In the New Testament, the book of James, James says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The church will pray that the God of all justice would bring justice to every aspect of this deeply disturbing situation, especially how racism in its effects have impacted our country for hundreds of years. Now, there's a couple things going on in there that I think are very important to unpack. <clears throat> the first is that in this situation, we have been praying that justice would be done. And so um, with the charging of the officer in question, um, the situation, the death of uh, George Floyd happened on Monday and the charging on Friday, that is the fastest that the city of uh, Minneapolis has ever charged an officer. And he's been charged with murder in the third degree as well as manslaughter. And so now that charge will go to the courts and we will continue to pray that justice will be done. But notice that God is already answering that prayer. He's using his ordained means of government and structure. And so we ought not to take those things into our own hands. The scripture says, leave vengeance for the Lord. Something that's really important for us as we're thinking about this sense of justice is that we should fight for justice here, but we also need to remember justice and mercy. The scripture says it is the glory of a man to overlook an offense. Jesus in his um, earthly ministry ends that cycle of vengeance. You hit me, so I hit you. And you hit you, me, so that I'm going to hit you back. And I'm going to hit you harder. And what's interesting is that my own uh, ethnic background, um, I come from... Uh, Northern European Germanic tribes that were uh, pagan, that would that were very warlike, that would continually offer human sacrifices and fight and kill one another over and over and over again. It was an endless cycle, and it wasn't until the gospel came and broke in, and we heard about Jesus, who said, instead of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, I tell you, love your enemy, do good to those who persecute you. When he was on the cross, dying in our place for our sins, the most unjust death in the history of the world, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then the scripture says, greater love is no one than this, that they would lay down life for a friend. But God loved us that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Jesus flips the paradigm of justice, and he shows us mercy. And so we ought to be careful in our desire for justice, because if true justice were dealt against us, none of us would be here. And I say that fully wanting a functioning society, fully understanding that we need to bring justice to the oppressed, the marginalized. But I also want us to be a people of mercy as well. Justice and mercy, those two things kiss at the cross where sin is judged and forgiveness is given. And the truth is, in any movie, I was thinking about this with my girls, in any and every movie, um, especially if there's a bad guy character, there's really only two things that happen. Um, the bad guy either repents, recognizes the bad things that he's been doing, and becomes a good guy at the end, or he is judged, he is punished, he receives justice, and so he's killed or driven out or exiled or something happens to him, but there's only two things that happen to evil. And so when we look at the cross, we see two things. We see justice and we see mercy. And we need to be a people of justice and mercy. God would bring an end to the destructive rioting in Minneapolis, Los Angeles. Now we can say Seattle. Um, as his children, we trust that God's hand is moving even now. Moreover, we know that ultimate justice is his now and forever.
<clears throat> and so our hope and prayer is that we can even experience a, um, a sense of that justice now, um, that those who need to be arrested would be arrested, that those who need healing would be healing, that the, with the case of George Floyd, that there would be justice administrated in the midst of that. We're trusting that God is at work in all of this. We don't really understand how, we don't understand what, but we know that someday we will. The image that I've shared with our church family several times, but again, is very appropriate, is um, the church father Augustine talks about this world as being like when you're right up close to a stained glass window. And when you're right up close and you're looking at it and you're, you know, your eye is almost next to it, all you can see is just this jagged glass. And it's so random and chaotic and fractured and all over the place and it makes no sense. And then he says, you step back and you can see how what seemed like chaos shows design. And what seemed like meaninglessness shows intentionality. And what seemed like this little insignificant piece actually fit into this beautiful tapestry. And that God worked all things together for good. We go on here, we say, Rainier Valley Church is committed to be a part of gospel change in our nation through the proclamation of the good news, that we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were reconciled first to our Father in heaven, and consequently we are reconciled to one another. For the dividing wall of hostility is abolished because he is our peace. We can have hope for genuine unity, healing, reconciliation with one another. That is the gospel truth. The gospel doesn't just sit out kind of on its own. It's not just a message about meeting God and how we go to heaven when we die. The gospel is good news for here and now. The gospel is about a new identity, a new family, and a new destiny. And part of that new family. So we, we want to be Rainier Valley Church in South Seattle. We want to seek the good of our city through the conversion of people as they see and hear the gospel proclaim, the good news, that they can be made right with God and they can be made right with others. And then they can see that. We want to demonstrate it through the life of our people, that people from different backgrounds, different ages, different races, different cultures, different languages, that we come together to worship Jesus because the dividing wall of hostility has been gone. So we proclaim the good news, we demonstrate the good news, and then we should. The church has a, a role for denouncing sin in our culture. Racism is a wicked sin. Murder is a wicked sin. We want to honor God by proclaiming the good news, demonstrating the good news, and denouncing the sin in this world. And we believe by doing those three things, we can, um, Lord willing, bring about some gospel change, be used to bring about unity, healing, and reconciliation. And so we concluded our elder statement by saying this, Rainier Valley Church calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for mercy, help, healing in our nation. Lord, humble us, heal us, and use us. As a church, we want to be humbled. The scripture says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. We want, we want the Lord to heal us. Some of us are hurting. Some of us are angry. Some of us are feeling a sense of rage. And so we, we want to invite the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart and your soul this morning. And then we want the Lord to use us. God, use us. Use our proclamation and our demonstration and our denunciation. Use it all for your glory and the good of others. Save, restore, build, change, transform. Use us in powerful, powerful ways. And so if you are listening to this this morning and you are feeling shaken or frustrated or fearful or angry or indifferent, I just want to encourage you with something. Um, we have a safe place in God. When there's nowhere else to go to, in the midst of a quarantine, in the midst of relational challenges, in the midst of racial tensions, in the midst of a society that's fraying at the edges, we have a safe place in God. So uh, if you have a Bible with you, we're not going to spend long on here, but um, go ahead and open it to Psalm 46. 
It's a psalm many of you may be familiar with. It's a beautiful psalm, and I just wanted to, to share it with you. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When it feels like there is no safe place in this world, when it feels like this world is falling apart, we go to God. He is our refuge. That's kind of an ancient term for like, imagine like a Hebrew safe room. <laughs> when everything is overwhelming and everything is crushing and everything is frustrating, go to God as a refuge. He is our strength. And strength is the ability to withstand force or pressure that's coming in on you. And many of you probably feel, even in these moments, force or pressure just just kind of breaking you, cracking you down, whether it's going on four, four months of quarantine, whether it's family or friends, whether it's you or them struggling with health, health issues, whether it's the racial tension that you have experienced in your own life or that you were seeing in the culture. It's just, it feels like this force is pushing down on you. And I want to encourage you like the psalmist. God is a refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, because he's present, because he's with us even now, we don't have to go to church as much as I long to be in the building worshiping with you guys again. We don't have to be at church to be with God. He is right there with us. He's omnipresent. He is in all places. He is a spirit. He's not a person like us, and so he can be in all places. He is right with you as you're watching this. He's right with me as I'm speaking this. He is right with the folks in downtown right now. He is everywhere, all present. And he's a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And I, I love this language, and I just think it's so appropriate for the moment that we find ourselves in. Though the earth gives way, Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Think for a moment of this. This is cataclysmic imagery. This is decreation language. This is all that was stable in the Hebrew mind, earth and mountains, being thrown into the sea. All the stability, all the, um, the solidness, in the Hebrew mind, what if the whole world comes undone? We're not going to be afraid. We will not fear because God is with us. When all that seems stable becomes unstable. When all that was calm goes to chaos. When all that we depended on becomes undependable. There is one who is with us through all of it. And that is our God a present help in times of trouble. In the midst of a global pandemic that has killed hundreds of millions with vaccines still far off and testing all over the place, with civil liberties and freedoms in hot debate, with quarantine now moving into a four, fourth month, with potential food shortages, with discussions about a, another Great Depression or a global economic collapse. And now to top it all off with rioting and burning in downtown Seattle and Minneapolis and Los Angeles and Chicago and Atlanta and Philadelphia and cities all over the country. God is with us, church family. God is with you, brother or sister. He's right there with you. God is here. God is near. God has not abandoned you. God has not turned against you. Everything else changes. Everything else will change and will continue to change. There may be turmoil. There may be uncertainty. We might be on the cusp of things situationally that are far worse than what we've endured. But there's one hope, unshakable, un ending hope that we have, and that is God is near. God is with us. God is our help, even in the midst of our troubles. And so the psalmist goes on, and he switches um, his perspective a little bit. And so if we talked about God's power 
in chaos. Now we're going to talk about God's presence in the city. This is picking up in verse 4. It says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. That is Jerusalem. And this is actually getting at a physical river. But what he's actually doing, stick with us here. It says, The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So what's happening here is there is this ancient language. Imagine uh, the city of Jerusalem surrounded by enemy armies. And what the city had that was very precious and important was that it had a f- underground flow of water that could essentially water um, the city even if they were completely locked down. Even if they were barricaded and blockaded so that they couldn't get food supplies, they would still be able to have a source of water. And what the psalmist is saying is using that sort of battle imagery and he's saying that our citizenship is not in Jerusalem but the new Jerusalem. And our substance, our sustaining liquid is not just water but it's the water of life. It is God. And so even if everything else is cut off and everything else falls apart, we have an internal source of nourishment and vitality. And that is our God who can never be taken from us, never be removed. Though the mountains tremble and they fall into the sea, though a global pandemic, though racial tensions sweep the nation, though the world may feel like it is falling apart, our God is there within our heart. And so it continues. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. Isn't that a great poetic depiction of what it feels like right now in our culture and in our world? The nations raging and the kingdoms are tottering. There is no sure foundation apart from Christ. He is the rock. We build our house on the rock and it will stand in the midst of a storm. We build it on the sand and it will fall. And nations and kingdoms are falling. But the true kingdom, the kingdom of our Lord and King, will persevere regardless and despite any suffering and difficulty. I love the way pastor and author Francis Chan talked about it. He said that the true church of God is like a diamond. And you can take a sledgehammer And with all your might, you can try and hit that diamond and it would make no difference. The church is indestructible. Now, the way we do ministry and what we have to walk through might change, but God's promises never change. He is faithful. His mercies are new every morning. And so we can depend on that even as the nations rage and the kingdoms totter. When God speaks, when he utters his voice, Every other worldly philosophy melts away. The the Lord of hosts is with us. Or another way you could say that is the the, uh, general of heaven's armies. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And we'll circle back to that in the final refrain. So we now move from God's presence in the city to um, God over all the nations. And it says this, Come. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. And so to look forward at what God has for us, we need to look back at what God has done for us. There is this beautiful pattern in many of the Psalms where the psalmist remembers back in particular to the Exodus when God liberates his people from their bondage, from their slavery From the racism and oppression that they suffered in Egypt, he liberates them to be his people. And they look back and they remember because God moved in power, because he was faithful, because he heard our prayers, because he rescued us, because he initiated, because he sustains us. We know that in the future, he will be good to us as well. And I wonder for you, as you think about the challenges and the difficulties we're facing now, I wonder as you look back on your life, What are those times that you can think about where God showed up in power? Whether it was an explicit miracle, whether it was um, he served you in some way, guidance, teaching, how whatever it was, how has God blessed you in your life? Remember those times, cherish those times, because they are the fuel 
for faith in the future. The God who is with you will be the God who sustains you, will be the God who carries you till the end. That's the truth that we believe and remember. And so he goes on and he says, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. And how does he do that? I love this. He breaks the bow, the bow, uh, archery, shooting, killing from far away. Um, he uh, shatters the spear in which you would be thrust through close up. He burns the chariots with fire. That is the technology of the time. And it's worthless compared to the power of God. And so verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Here's what I want to call us to today, church family. And this is just Pastor Kyle speaking to you. I want to call us to what this psalm calls us to. This is a call to surrender. This is a call to submit and surrender to the authority of God, to repent of our sins, to run to the cross, to be still, and to know that he is God. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. That's where all this is going. I can't tell you how we'll get there, but I can tell you that when Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I commanded you, behold, I'll be with you till the end of the age, that every enemy must be put under Jesus's feet and the last enemy will be death. I can tell you that those things will happen because we have the very promises of God as the bedrock for that faith. I can't tell you how and I can't tell you when, but I know that they will. And so we can be still, can let the anxieties and the fears fall to the wayside. And we can remember that he is God. He will be exalted in the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And it's interesting because in this psalm, we see him ending with that refrain over and over again. The God of Jacob, the God of Jacob, the God of Jacob. Jacob, if you've read the book of Genesis, Jacob is the worst. Jacob is a liar and a trickster and a deceiver and a hustler and just the absolute worst. The scripture actually says more bad stuff about Jacob than it does good stuff. And it's fitting that God would identify himself as the God of Jacob. Because our God is a God of mercy and grace. Our God is a God of love and forgiveness and kindness and mercy and grace. He's the God of Jacob. Jacob was the worst. Jacob did not earn that position. He did not earn that title. And the fact that God would be pleased to, in the sacred scriptures, have it written that he is the God of Jacob shows you that God is a God of forgiveness and love and kindness. He's a God of mercy. He's a God that forgives his enemies, that does good to those who persecute him. And so, church, let us look to our God. Let us worship our God. Let us be still. Let us lay down our anxieties. Let us remember that he will be exalted in the nations. He will be exalted on the earth.